Hello everybody, welcome back. Another video here on Crohn's disease. It's gastrointestinal pathology day. Uh, it's Friday, GI Friday. Uh, this is going to be the last lecture, right? And we are done with winter 2020. Uh, so, yep, here we go. And this is all about Crohn's disease. Which is a very important subject, right? There's a lot of patients you'll run into over your careers with this problem. There's students that I know will have this problem. So let's talk about Crohn's disease. Uh, it is granulomatous and inflammatory. We'll talk about the inflammatory lesions that affect the entire thickness of the intestine and it can even form granulomas after the inflammation process becomes chronic. It can affect any part of the elementary canal or tract from the mouth to the anus it's not normal for it to affect the mouth uh, though it's a little rare but it could and there's no cure for this disease in fact we're not even a hundred percent sure what causes it we'll look at some gene mutations and some environmental factors but they still work in working this one out uh, but it is a chronic disease it doesn't usually stay all the time in most people it tends to hit uh, for periods of time and then go into remission and then hit again. It uh, can be quite disabling though. It is one of the three inflammatory bowel diseases. Uh, so the three, great question, right? Great multiple, which one of the following is not one of the uh, the three inflammatory bowel diseases? So Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and then there's the unidentified or unclassified inflammatory bowel disease class. Crohn's disease in general skips around and can hit different regions of the the GI tract. Ulcerative colitis is limited because it's called colitis. It's limited to the colon and uh, we won't get to this one. I think I have a YouTube video on that though so this is all good stuff to watch before boards. So as we said before we don't we don't understand this one. The pathophysiology is not completely understood. It's probably a combination of factors though, uh, genetic, environmental, immunologic, and but whatever it is, we know one thing, it is a wicked inflammation process that, that develops not just in the mucosal layer, like ulcerative colitis only affects the mucosal layer, it's, it's a transmural inflammation, meaning the entire thickness of the colon, so it's a wicked uh, inflammation. There are three classic symptoms. We'll get into the symptoms later on in the lecture, but patients typically have abdominal pain and diarrhea and weight loss because of the diarrhea and malnutrition. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. Vitamin B12 deficiency, we've already mentioned in lectures before. Symptoms could be all the time present or go into periods of remission. The epidemiology, it is number two inflammatory bowel disease in adults. So ulcerative colitis is actually a little more common than Crohn's disease. But with regard to the pediatric population, kids, it's number one inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, an accurate assessment of it's kind of difficult. What's the worldwide prevalence? There's inconsistent ways to diagnose it, so it's pretty tough to tell what the prevalence is uh, throughout the world of this thing. Um, we do know though that the prevalence is increasing, which is strange because the prevalence of ulcerative colitis is actually on the decline since the 90s. So there's something we're not getting, maybe something environmental. Uh, there was a recent Scottish study, quite famous, that involved a 40-year study of Crohn's disease patients and it's been shown to have increased over those 40 years by 500 uh, percent. So we're not sure if it's the diet, the Western diet kind of infecting the world. Don't know what it is but it's on the rise. The estimated prevalence of Crohn's disease in North America is about 0.1 percent. So uh, 
much more common than Marfan. Still not super common. Remember, Marfan is 0.01% of the population. So about one every, out of every 100 uh, people are affected by this. So at, at any given time, there's about 650,000 people in North America with this disease. The There are some risky time periods for this to pop up so you can make, get diagnosed for the first symptoms to rear their ugly heads. Third decade of life, most common. Seventh decade of life is the second most common time. There's also this weird north-south grade, south gradient that we've seen in a couple of studies that have been mirrored in France and the United States, which both have northern regions which are more or less sunny and southern regions which get a lot more sun and Florida doesn't even in California don't even get winters right there's no snow a lot more sunshine uh, and they both found the same thing that people exposed to more sunlight they're less likely to get Crohn's disease so they think there must might be something with the vitamin D that is protective or the natural vitamin D that is produced by sunlight some of the key diagnostic features of Crohn's disease, it tends to strike discontinuously. I do like this slide. There's been quite a few test questions on this one. Uh, so the discontinuous, what the heck does that mean? It means that maybe it'll affect your distal ileum and then it'll affect your, oh, your, your jejunum and then it, it skips so it can skip regions. Uh, these are called skip lesions. It tends to present with skip lesions. So the example I use, six inches of the, six inches of the distal ileum are hit, then eight inches of the transverse colon, then maybe a bit of the rectum is hit. Alternative colitis is not like this. Uh, it doesn't have skip lesions. Uh, typ it typically only hits the colon and it goes continuous. What about the pain? Uh, this could be quite painful, stomach pain, abdominal pain. The inflammation uh, and the stretch, and we'll talk about how some scar tissue can form, can trigger nociceptors and cause abdominal pain. Some people can be quite disabling. Crohn's disease, another favorite slide. There are two favorite targets. The distal ileum, oh no, we've learned a lot about that distal ileum. Who lives there? Those are the cubulin receptors or the cabam receptors, right? Cabam receptors, uh, that's the only place in your body that vitamin B12 can efficiently be taken in. Remember vitamin B plus what? Who, who chaperones the vitamin D to the final cabam receptor? Intrinsic factor, good. Vitamin B plus intrinsic factor uh, hold hands and they're taken in the distal ileal cells uh, via the cabam receptors. Uh, so proximal colon is also affected, right? So maybe the cecum and the ascending colon are affected as well. So therefore, people with Crohn's disease might actually present with vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, there's some one study showed some uh, some targets. Distal ileum was hit 35% of the time by itself. Then 35% of the time, the ileum and the colon were hit together, and 15% of the time, only the colon was hit. Uh, they called this when it affects only the colon Crohn's colitis. Crohn's colitis. Therefore, it'd be confusing with ulcerative colitis, right? A little confusing. Only remember, Crohn's disease is a full thickness inflammation of the intestinal wall. Ulcerative colitis only affects the mucosa. The jejunum is could be affected, but it's rarely affected in isolation. Skip lesions it could show up there, but uh, stomach and esophagus are also rarely affected. Uh, if it tends to show, if it does hit the stomach or esophagus. Patients tend to have Crohn's disease in the ileum as colon as well. Uh, then some people have, this is, uh, some of you probably know what I've said already. This Maybe this is what you don't know. Uh, Crohn's disease is notorious and ulcerative colitis, not quite as much, uh, but 
Not only does the inflammation hit the GI tract, it can hit the musculoskeletal system, the appendicular and the axial skeleton. So you can have some very destructive arthritis associated with Crohn's disease. So we need to fall down this rabbit hole. I like this rabbit hole. So AIM or AIM or EIM, extraintestinal manifestations means the inflammation is manifesting outside of the, uh, the GI tract. Or you could call it inflammatory bowel disease arthropathies is another one. Uh, so these occur in about 25% of patients with Crohn's disease. They usually hit the appendicular skeleton, especially the knees and ankles. Um, it can also occur in ulcerative colitis, but not nearly as frequently. Uh, so in our patients with uh, EAM, not only is the GI tract affected, but so are other regions of the body. Again, musculoskeletal is by far the most common target of these extraintestinal manifestations in Crohn's disease. A major risk factor for getting these extraintestinal manifestations or knee arthritis, destruction of the knee or the ankle, if you have really severe Crohn's disease, in the small bowel, that's a bad sign that's going to hit elsewhere in the body as well, especially if you've had Crohn's so bad that they'd have, they, they have had to take out a chunk of your, your ileum. Uh, that seems to be a real bad sign that you're going to have arthritis in the joints of the appendicular skeleton as well. And then if it occurs in one region, let's say it hits your ankles and starts ripping up your ankles and you can't walk, uh, about 25% of those, it hits your knees or hits your wrists or hits somewhere else. So it can be quite right, widespread once it starts. Um, here's another thing. We talked a lot about uh, atrial septal defects causing this condition and heart conditions and lung tumors, right? Um, sometimes they're normal, so don't let everybody freak out. Um, but yeah, this is clubbing of the nails, and we already talked about that. Uh, but it's also commonly seen in patients with Crohn's disease. And see, this is an example of what's Crohn's disease have to do with, uh, with hypoxemia, or the not enough oxygen in the blood the bloodstream, which is thought originally to cause this. We can understand that with maybe Eisenmenger syndrome conditions, but uh, Crohn's disease, how does it manifest? We don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, about 38% of the patients with Crohn's disease, uh, one of the early signs could be clubbing of the nails like this. Uh, can also happen with ulcerative colitis, but only about 15% of the time. Who are the targets, uh, typical targets? Well, the musculoskeletal system is appendicular skeleton is number one. Uh, it can act hit the skin, the muscles in the skin as well. So not the skeleton, but the actual muscles can become inflamed uh, and the skin can become inflamed. It can affect the eyes, the liver, the kidneys, the urogenital system, uh, the vascular system, a whole bunch more. These are super rare though, but musculoskeletal is, if it's going to happen, it's probably going to be musculoskeletal. Uh, so if it does hit the musculoskeletal system, they call this entropathic arthritis or arthropathy. So make sure you know that term. When you see entropathic arthritis or arthropathy, think of either Crohn's, think of the inflammatory bowel diseases, because that could be a general answer. Uh, what's the cause of entropathic arthropathy, arthritis? Uh, the, the answer could say ulcerative colitis, that's true. Could say Crohn's disease, that's true. Could just say inflammatory bowel disease, that's also true. So make sure you know that. Uh, there are two major divisions, of course, of intrapathic arthritis, the peripheral arthropathies, which we've kind of been talking about, the knees and the ankles, and then the axial arthropathies. Uh, the Crohn's disease in particular loves the sacroiliac joints, just like who else loves the sacroiliac joints? And when I says loves, I mean loves to attack them. Ankylosing spondylitis right, seronegative spondyl arthropathies. It is a member seronegative spondyl arthropathy. So it occurs in about 20% of patients with Crohn's disease get these peripheral arthropathies, said that already. 
Uh, the inflammation process attacks the joints of the appendicular skeleton, said that. Starts out, the first presentation, the patient just has pain. Or arthralgia is the official way to say. Painful joint. Stiffness. Maybe some swelling. Without treatment, and you might catch this early enough, uh, you might get some destruction of the joint itself. That's why people have unexplained swelling in their joints. they got to be worked up to make sure it doesn't destroy the joints. Okay, less frequently, uh, ulcerative colitis can do this as well, uh, but it's usually Crohn's disease. So loves the knees, loves the ankles. Uh, it's much more common than it hitting the spine. It's more rare, uh, but it does happen. What do you think of those knees? While you're thinking, let me get some water to keep my voice hanging in there. How do they look? Are they good? No good, right? Where's the cartilage? This guy's bone on bone, right? Um, so, long time Crohn's disease patient who also developed knee pain and and it wrecked his, the inflammatory process destroyed all the cartilage uh, in his in his knees. Yep. That's a blow up of that. Pretty gnarly looking, right? Not much more to say about that. Uh, it can, as we said, affect the axial skeleton. Only about 7% of inflammatory bowel disease patients end up with axial skeletal man manifestations. Uh, when it does occur, it usually affects the SI joints. That causes a spondylitis, is, an, is a destruction, just like of the ankle or the knee, you can destroy the facet joints, the zygopotheseal joints, the Z, or the Z joints, whatever you want to call them. Uh, we're trying to teach chiropractors to call them zygopotheseal joints, but that's when you go into the, the real world, they call them the facet joints still. Uh, so you can wreck those, inflame those, just like that knee picture. It also affects the sacroiliac joints, so you can get a sacroiliac or sacroiliitis uh, from that. I don't think that is spelled right, is it? I don't think that's spelled right. Uh, the inflammatory damage, uh, I said that, zygopotheseals and SOAs can be ripped up by the same inflammatory process. Early patient symptoms, uh, well maybe of, of these uh, extra intestinal manifestations, maybe they come into your office with back pain. Most of the time it's going to just be a sprained facet or muscle injury, disc tear or something like that, but every now and then uh, maybe it's something more insidious uh, like an inflammatory attack of the facet joint secondary to uh, the same thing that causes the the Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Uh, it could be attacking the low back facet joints or the SI joints. Patients present with morning stiffness that improves during the day as they get warmed up. Classic of ankylosing spondylitis as well. Okay, um, so the Crohn's disease related spondylitis or enteropathic arthritis or arthropathy, we said that. It is one of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Uh, therefore, if you do some blood work on these patients, which you should, you'll come back with uh, HLA B27 positive. In fact, 75% do come back with that. Uh, you can also test them for rheumatoid factor and that's going to be negative. When you get that combination of HLA B27 positive and rheumatoid factor negative, uh, then they're going to be in that, probably it's going to be one of the, not always, but it could well be one of the seronegative spinal arthropathies. Okay? Um, there are other seronegative spinal arthropathies. You have to know this list. In fact, I'm, I don't think I had you in embryology spinal anatomy, but they're learning this in first quarter now. You need to know this. This needs to be burned into your brain. Um, so here they are. Ankylosing spondylitis is by far the most common of the seronegative spinal arthropathies. Loves the SI joints. Psoriatic arthritis. Sometimes these patients present with psoriasis as well, which we'll talk about in seventh quarter. Um, who's that golfer? Phil Nicholson is the sorry, kind of the spokesperson for Embrol. Is it a tumor necrosis anti anti tumor necrosis factor alpha 
uh, inhibitor. Uh, those are heavy, powerful anti-inflammatories that are used to fight these diseases. Uh, and there, third, there's our inflammatory bowel disease associated spondyloarthropathy, aka enteropathic arthropathy or arthritis. So those are all the KA, OKA. So you got to know that stuff uh, because you never know uh, how that's going to show up on boards. Uh, who are they? Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are the inflammatory bowel diseases. Uh, uh, then we have, we used to call it Reiter's syndrome. With always Reiter, remember Reiter, pencil and a cup destruction of joints. Uh, but they're trying to call it reactive arthritis now instead of Reiter's syst uh, syndrome. Uh, but that's also seronegative spondyloarthropathy. Uh, Whipple's and Beckett's disease are also more rare diseases. Uh, probably not going to learn too much. Probably in uh, they'll teach you that uh, as you get go through the x-ray pathology department won't say much about it uh, but it loves the SI joints so bilateral sacroiliitis sacroili sacroiliitis is the most common uh, attack uh, if it's going to hit the axial skeleton very painful hard to differentiate from ac from ankylosing spondylitis because they're both inflammatory and they both rip up the SI joints. 90% of people with ankylosing spondylitis have HLAB27 which is a marker on the white blood cell. Let's look at a case here. 38 year old male presents with chronic low back pain which is particularly bad in the morning. Kind of gets better as the day goes on. Can't think of any any reason he'd have pain thought maybe he had a virus he doesn't have a particularly heavy job he doesn't beat his body up with some motocross racing or anything like that uh, whenever you have a patient come in like that you gotta raise an eyebrow it doesn't make sense why is he having back pain and pain and tenderness uh, with compression so when you push down on these SI joints they're very painful which is unusual take a picture what do you think of the x-ray well, where's those little slits you're supposed to see? You can see a tiny bit of it right here. I don't know if you look at enough radiographs to see, but I mean, this is destroyed, right? He's only 38 years old. Uh, so he's got sagittal facets, right? He's got facet tropism, tropism as well, but I digress. Uh, let's see, multiple joint arthropathy. Uh, so sometimes it can present when it hits the the appendicular skeleton, uh, it can present in more than one joint. So you can get a plausi articular arthropathy or a poly articular arthropathy. What the heck does that mean? Well, poly is easy. Uh, and depending on what author you use, poly articular arthropathy means more than or equal to five or more joints are inflamed and hit by this disease. And so they could be three finger like three metacarpal phalangeal joints of fingers two three and four uh, and maybe your knee so five or more oh, I guess that was only four wasn't it I can't count and your ankle so that patient would have a poly articular arthropathy uh, if it's less than five it's called a plausi articular arthropathy uh, ulcerative colitis doesn't typically cause these uh, plausi or poly articular arthropathies. That's usually Crohn's disease. And uh, arthralgia is typically minor, uh, but they occur at the same time with intestinal flare-ups. Uh, so if you have a flare-up of Crohn's disease and you have diarrhea and you don't feel good, um, it's then you're at the same time that's going on, uh, your knees will start aching or whatever joints are being affected start aching as well. So there's a relationship between your uh, your peripheral arthropathy and your actual intestinal arthropathy. What's the ideology of these things? We don't really know. Uh, it's not fully understood. There's no question though that there is a wicked inflammation going on within the affected intestine. Uh, it could be sustained, could hit or miss, it could come and go. Um, but the $64,000 question is, what the heck causes it? What is the trigger for this inflammation? Uh, and the theories, we'll talk about a couple, Sue, are one superbug, 
uh, and then we'll talk about dysbiosis and we'll talk about some gene mutations that are theories so let's take a look at some of these factors in fact there's three main factors it can be broken down into genetic risk factors and mutations environmental factors and then immunologic factors which we're not going to get them maybe Dr. Dole's already talked about that a little bit uh, but let's look at some of the genetic factors and mutations uh, so there's some risk factors if mom and dad have uh, have a problem and this goes for ulcerative colitis as well a lot of this goes for ulcerative colitis uh, you got a you got a 10 times chance higher of having it uh, so if a first degree relative has Crohn's disease uh, the first degree relative is, shares a 50% of your own DNA therefore you have a 10 times higher risk of getting it than the normal population about 20% of Crohn's patients uh, say that they if you when you question them say yep my mom had that my grandfather had that uh, so it's definitely hereditary uh, if you're a uh, if you're from an Eastern European Jewish uh, background they tend to have a slightly higher risk just in general uh, monozygotic twins uh, they have a concordance rate of 67 uh, percent so if one one has it the other one has it monozygote that those are identical twins all right uh, so they share much of the same DNA uh, so big chance but yet not all not both twins have it so but definitely a risk factor definitely need to know this gene so they're calling it nowadays the card 15 gene and the card 15 gene mutation and so we need to talk about that it's on chromosome 16 uh, it's been around since 2001 and two big labs uh, almost simultaneously discovered this at the same time and both published papers on it uh, and that we've learned quite a bit about it since but it's still when it originally came out they call it the node 2 gene uh, but they changed the name it was confusing because there was other genes with similar names so they changed it to card 15 gene uh, and that stands that stands to this day uh, and uh, this mutation is not related with ulcerative colitis at all so this is specific uh, for Crohn's disease so card 15 mutation now if you get some genetic testing done and uh, those tests that you can buy uh, what is it 23 and me they do tests for this now so you can find out uh, if you're if you just have one of your alleles remember you have a gene uh, from mom and a gene from dad card 15 gene if one is mutated and the others okay uh, then about 50% of Crohn's disease patients have this set up 20% uh, of healthy controls have this so heterogeneous gene mutation are present in about 50% so if you go in the hospital people were suffering Crohn's disease and hospitalized and you test them about 50% of them will have this set up uh, if you test normal people walking down the street 20% will have one mutated gene yet not have it therefore the specificity the false positive rate and the sensitivity false negative rate uh, is quite high however uh, if both of your genes are mutated there's a pretty star tr strong chance you're going to get Crohn's disease 17 fold that's a significant increase in the risk so you have a 17 times greater chance than some normal person walking down the street with non mutated card 15 genes okay so what is the mutated card 15 gene product so what is that gene because normally it makes all kinds of stuff right one of the things card 15 makes are really important you probably learned Dr. Doe probably taught you about toll like receptors or TLR receptors are super important these are found on some of the first line of defense cells like macrophage monocytes and the dendritic cells are uh, like uh, for example one dendritic cell is the Langerham cells of the skin uh, these are the the army these are the scouts of the army and they're the first ones to see the invading troop uh, and they have these toll-like receptors on them 
uh, and they're super important because it's these receptors here's here's what they cartoon of it um, these receptors can recognize all sorts of bugs and they're able to recognize self versus non-self if it's a bug not only do they recognize and sound the alarm by releasing cytokines and all kinds of stuff uh, but they can bind to it so here's some toll-like -like receptors binding to oh let's say a bacteria uh, and it's on a macrophage or macrophage which is the first line of defense type cell and it binds to it and uh, destroys it and represents it right uh, so these are antigen presenting type cells and then the lymphocytes come in and mark it for destruction you know that whole deal um, but if you have a mutation in your card 15 you have mutated toll-like receptors and now your scouts who are looking for the disease coming in through the skin or through the intestine in our case they don't do a very good job of it because they can't recognize it because these are mutated and so they let the enemy go right by and don't attack it and that is a problem because uh, the enemy gets into your intestinal wall and starts dividing and multiplying uh, then finally your body sees it when it's too late and now you got a rip-roaring inflammation going and there's a fight uh, and the bugs against the uh, against the body's immune system and who's the casualty the f kind of collateral damage to that is the battleground which is your intestinal wall it gets destroyed and full of scar tissue and granulomatous tissue uh, and that's that's part of the problem okay so everything I just said the toll-like receptors the mutated receptors they let the bacteria walk right by uh, and it causes a wild growth of the bacteria and massive inflammation and everything I just said and the, of course the pain and the stretch on the, the nociceptors will result in stomach pain so a lot of people have stomach pain um, a card 15 makes another important product it makes some of the components uh, which make PANF cells. I don't think we got to do much uh, intestinal uh, histology like we did with the stomach. But these PANF cells, they live down at the crypts of Lieberkuhn. Uh, these guys are really important uh, because if bugs come and they're floating around the intestine, they're going to try to, some of them are going to drop into these crypts of Lieberkuhn and try to break through these epithelial cells. Uh, and here's the interstitium here and here's the blood vessels would be right uh, in here oh I didn't turn on my drawing tools I could have drawn that um, uh, but yeah so these guys secrete some very potent and poisonous substances which kill the bugs uh, specifically something called lysine and defensin are two of these antibacterial proteins which destroy uh, the invading virus if they're mutated do you think they work very good they don't uh, and they can even become phagocytic too right panic cells have the ability to phagocytize I'm not sure if I wrote that in here uh, but if you have a mutation they can't kill the bacteria and the bacteria can walk right in uh, and they get into the interstitium and then and then the car and then the uh, toll-like receptors if they get into the interstitium past the epithelium maybe we've got some macrophages or some dendritic cells hanging out waiting but they're mutated too so they let them go right by and start multiplying and build up and by the time we finally recognize them uh, we got a, a big wicked infl a wicked amount of them and it causes a horrible inflammation and that's kind of the, the deal with that okay therefore mutated card 15 um, and well everything I just said everything I just said I don't think I need to repeat this um, one theory for th that supports this uh, hypothesis about card 15 mutations is uh, panath cells are super dense there's more panath cells in the distal ileum than anywhere else in these in the GI tract and guess where the favorite spot of Crohn's uh, disease is to attack same place distal ileum so uh, maybe in the proximal ileum or jejunum maybe the pan of cells are not that there's not that many of them there's other mechanisms that can defeat bacteria there uh, but in the distal ileum it's easy to get through there so they can get through all right what about some environmental factors the research indicates 
some environmental factors also play a role in the development of Crohn's disease. There's infectious agents, there's antigens, there's some habits, smoking in particular we're going to talk about. Um, there's uh, gut flora imbalances. Everybody's got a balance between good healthy bacteria that live in your gut that you actually need and a little bit of bad bacteria uh, in everybody's gut. Uh, but Crohn's patients tend to have more bad bacteria than good bacteria. If there's too many bad bacteria, there's, they're always trying to get into the intestinal wall and they can do so. Especially if, if you have some of those mutations I talked about. and Your defenses aren't good. Got to talk about smoking. This is really strange. House, uh, I was a great fan of House. I don't know if you've seen it. That While everybody's confined to their houses now because uh, of coronavirus, this is a great series. If you've never seen House, uh, you can stream that. Oh, he is uh, just so funny. It's just a great show. Uh, and you learn, there's a lot of, uh, they had real uh, infectious disease docs making sure everything was right. And one of the episodes uh, characterizes the difference between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So smoking is a really strong risk factor for the development of Crohn's disease. Very strangely, heavy smokers are actually protected against ulcerative colitis. We don't know why that is, um, but there's no doubt about that. And in fact, House got in trouble because he hates clinic anyway. But on his clinic duty, he, he, one of the ulcerative colitis patients, he prescribed, he wrote out a script for cigarette, heavy cigarette smoking. And of course, his boss went crazy when she, the patient complained. And, but it was, I mean, he, you know, the cigarette smoking is so detrimental to so many other things. He should have prescribed some, um, some heavy duty uh, anti inflammatories, but that's House. But anyway, he, I mean, to make the point, it's very strange. We don't know why it is. Uh, thought cigarette, but with regard to Crohn's disease, the cigarette particles are thought to circulate in the bloodstream uh, and and somehow they land the, in the interstitium on the apical or the basal lateral surface of the epithelial cells. They bind and turn on genes in those epithelial cells and they make the tight junctions between the cells very loose. Remember the tight junctions, those are the cams that prevent things from sneaking between epithelial cells. Uh, and they get damaged somehow and bugs can go right through them in patients who smoke heavy. Um, and so again, this is all about getting bugs into your intestinal wall which causes a wicked inflammation and that's one way smokers are at risk for that thing. Some other kind of fun facts here. Uh, patients who've had an appendectomy, I've had appendicitis and they needed to have it cut out, that's an appendectomy, before the age of 20, another super strong risk factor. Doesn't bode super well for the future. Uh, you probably, but not always, but you have a chance of getting Crohn's disease later in life if you have an early appendectomy. Uh, let's see, and we'll it's thought that by removing the appendix takes out the backup copy uh, of the intestinal gut flora uh, and without that copy you get an imbalance uh, and that's kind of hard maybe Dr. Doe's already went over that I'm not going to go down that hole but it's quite interesting I'll let him or you get that somewhere else uh, excessive consumption of refined sugar there's some research that shows sugar junkies uh, tend to also have uh, more incidence of Crohn's disease. They think somehow it increases the permeability in the enterocytes, uh, which lets for greater bacteria invasion. The mechanism, they don't know. Uh, overuse of antibiotics. We know that antibiotics destroy the entire gut flora as well as the bad bug that you're trying to kill. Uh, and it causes an imbalance between the good bugs and the bad bugs. The bad bugs are harder to kill off than the good bugs. Good bugs unfortunately die easily. And so after your course of antibiotics, you're left with something called a dysbiosis. I would definitely know that word, dysbiosis, meaning that there's an imbalance between good versus bad bacteria. Uh, oral contraceptives also increase the risk of Crohn's disease. 
mechanism is unknown. The use, the long-term use of NSAIDs, and I'm not talking about you hurt your back and you use NSAIDs for a couple months. I'm talking people around these things for years. Uh, it does damage the mucosal barrier, intestinal mucosal barrier, and makes it more easy. Uh, makes it easier for bugs to get into the penetrate the wall, get through the epithelial cells. Some other theories are interesting. Uh, moms and dads who are overprotective of their kids might want to listen to this. Uh, so there is research that overprotective environmental practices and dietary practices increase the risk for Crohn's as well as ulcerative colitis. Uh, so some people are so freaked out about celiac disease. I didn't have time to talk about it, but I definitely have a YouTube video on it. Celiac disease is common. You'll get that in nutrition as well. Um, they get so freaked about celiac disease, they don't let their kids eat wheat, rye, or barley because they don't want them to get... I mean, you need that. Your young kids need to be exposed to all this different stuff so their immune system matures and becomes strong. Um, some people are so obsessed with such a clean house that there's no bugs around. Uh, kids are made to get dirty, uh, and they're exposed to things, and their body, their immune system gets used to seeing this stuff, and it starts to know... Uh, right from wrong and it knows starts to know who to attack and who not to attack drinking only pure water only bottled water um, you let them drink some tap water every now and then that's uh, good for them um, and then not letting the kids get dirty I, we used to have a neighbor who was like they're poor everybody's out playing in the rain and the mud and the poor kids are watching through the windows um, you know let let the kids be kids all right over cleaning the home you get the message so, and I'm not just talking, there's good research on that as well. Uh, then we have the superbug. I'm sure Dr. Doe talked about uh, the, uh, the AIEC bacteria, the adherent invasive E. coli. Uh, AIEC is a nasty bug. Uh, it has been linked and found in patients with Crohn's disease. This bug uh, is resistant to the panacells. Uh, in fact, panacells can release their chemicals to try to kill it. Panacells can also become uh, phagocytic, uh, and it goes right through them. It can't, it can't stop them. So it gets into the interstitium beneath the endothelial lining, and then it meets up with the macrophage. The macrophage try to attack it, and it kicks their butts. And not only that, it burls into the macrophage, almost like a virus, uh, and uses them and replicates inside of the macrophage. Uh, and hundreds of these, thousands, are released, uh, and you can get a wicked uh, inflammation. Once it gets bad enough, the body spots it. Uh, you're going to have a really big inflammation, big mess to clean up. Um, so that's the adherent invasive E. coli bug, quite a nasty bug. Uh, dysbiosis we talked about. There's quite a bit of evidence that shows that people with a a GI tract that is not balanced properly with good bugs versus bad bugs, they have too many bad bugs, uh, which is called the intestinal dysbiosis, increases the risk of having Crohn's disease. We don't know exactly what the cause is, but it makes sense. If you got too many bad bugs around, it's going to be pretty easy for some of those mischievous ones to get into the intestinal wall, get through the natural defenses, and cause an inflammation. Um, everything I pretty much said. Uh, notable, uh, there's a notable reduction. Who is uh, the? You can test for these things, right? There's a phylum, uh, the the Firmicutes phylum for. Firmicutes phylum uh, is in particular uh, those seem to be wiped out easily and you need this around for good bacterial health. These are the lactobacilli, the bacilli, uh, etc. Et uh, so people with Crohn's disease, if you do a culture of their gut, these guys are wiped out. Uh, so what if there's too many bad bacteria? Everything I said. The bad bugs are more likely to invade the wall and cause chronic inflammation. Right? Especially if you have mutated pan of cells uh, and sentinel cells that don't work. There's no toll receptor on there. Um, and they don't phagocytize. They don't secrete their, their poisons. Yeah, so 
That's the story with that. Okay, let's get into some clinical findings of the disease. So how do you know now, I mean, in a, if the patient comes into our practice, we're not going to know this, but a gastrointestinal doc will know this uh, from sending the camera down there, and if they're lucky, they might see an ulcer. So one of the earliest findings is the presence of a canker sore-like ulcer uh, called a uh, aphthous ulcer. A, like for apple, a, pH for f, aphthous, or why did I say they, aphthous. Aphthous ulcer. Af. That should be us. Sorry about that. I don't know why I put they there. Aphthous. It's my dictation software. Um, yep. Yeah, so there's chrome aphna or aphthe uh, means basically a canker sore like lesion. It's an ulcer that you can see it's small on the luminal surface. Uh, when Crohn's first starts and they uh, have you swallow the endoscopic camera, if you get lucky, you might see one of these little guys. They're small, they're under four millimeters. Let's take a look. There's a normal um, distal ileum, it looks like. And you can see there are the valves of Kirchring. I think you learned them as plica circularis. Uh, and if you can remember, the test is like got a velvety look to it. Those little tiny fingers that you can see, um, those are the villi. Remember, there's three, f there's all these folds, villi, microvilli. Um, and you get a chance, I think I have a video on that, but make sure you know your, your histology of the intestine. Uh, but yeah, this is beautiful and normal. Okay, let's take a look at this. What do you see here? While I get a drink of water. I'm sorry, I don't want to pause this either. I don't want to screw up this recording. I use um, a software that's notorious for losing your recordings and we don't want that to happen. Yeah, there's an ulcer right there. It looks a little red looking too, uh, but that's an aphthous ulcer. That's a Crohn's aphthous ulcer. All right, early Crohn's disease. That's an aphthous ulceration of the mucosal surface of the patient with early Crohn's disease. So how about late? So these are, they look like they're maybe a little more advanced. Um, those are, yeah, another Crohn's patients with numerous aphthous ulcers hanging out already. When these things heal, they, they heal with quite a bit of scar tissue. They heal like little mounds. And it starts to give the lumen kind of a cobblestone look, which is classic of Crohn's. So late stages, the these aphthous ulcers coalesce into larger ulcerations. Uh, when they heal, uh, they can, the scar tissue gives them a raised cobblestone look. Uh, and those cobblestones, if you biopsy those, those are granulomas underneath. This granulomatous tissue can be mixed in with that. Here's a cobblestone appearance. A patient with kind of early, late Crohn's. And that doesn't look right, right down there. Um, those are little cobblestones. That's all scar tissue from many, many attacks of ulcers. There's another one that's severe. I think that's actually a kind of a pitcher that doesn't look real to me. Um, but it gets the point across. That's a cobblestone. Uh, so granulomas have developed underneath that. Another early finding of Crohn's disease, in addition to the aphthous ulcers, is you have to go into the intestinal wall itself to see this, but you can have granulomas. Uh, and it's just wicked bunches of scar tissue uh, that has started. And they can be found through all the different layers of the intestinal wall. Um, yeah. Uh, the prevalence, uh, so this is highly characteristic of Crohn's disease. Uh, not always found, and that should be ulcerative colitis patients don't always have these things. The uh, presence of granulomatous Crohn disease is widely variable, too, uh, some 15%. But part of the problem with this, they, th they thought that the granulomatous upon biopsy were only present in 15% uh, or present on the surface. Uh, that's based on that capsule, swallowing that little capsule, that capsule endoscopy. Remember, we can't stick an endoscope uh, through either end to reach that far. Surgically, people who need surgery for Crohn's disease and they cut the intestine out, about 70% of them have granulomatous uh, within. 
Okay, here's a section. This is a granulomata. That's not normal tissue. I'm not going to ask you that. Uh, late findings still. So you, the ulcerations can get really large. Uh, and if the intestinal wall gets really invaded, the bugs can start kind of hanging out and living and start making little like ants uh, under the ground. They can have little tunnels and sinus tracts uh, and therefore you can have fistulas uh, going to different parts of the intestine. Uh, so and there's just a little cartoon of little fist sinus tracts in here. Uh, maybe one of them would they should have drawn one that come over like that. Did I turn my drawing tools on? No I didn't. I'm scared to stop this. I don't want to lose it. Um, yep, so that's what that looks like. So another problem in late stage, so if you get, if you keep getting that cobblestone look, those cobblestones get bigger and bigger, the size of your lumen starts getting more narrow and more narrow. And you can start to be, develop a, a beaver dam. Stenosis can occur to the point where some of the fecal material might get stuck. Uh, and now you got yourself a beaver dam. That's called bowel obstruction. Another weird thing is this fat wrapping phenomenon, which is just amazing. Uh, adipocytes on the outside of the intestine. Uh, there's epiploic appendages my group knows about. We should, I tested you on those in gross too. Uh, those fat bags, some of the cells in there can actually uh, invade into the intestine and spread over the entire intestine and become phagocytic. Uh, so those are almost almost like an atherosclerosis how the smooth muscle cells leave the tunica media and attack the inflammation process and become phagocytic. Same kind of deal here where the adipocytes can do the same thing. Uh, and it can get, uh, that's called fat wrapping. And people with severe Crohn's disease when they take out the distal ileum or whatever part they need to take out, that thing is wrapped up in fat. In fact, we're going to see a picture of it here. Another weird thing uh, is with regard to scar tissue adhesion formation, you can get adhesions actually, uh, we talked about them a little bit on the outside of the intestine, I think I did. Uh, if not, YouTube video on it. Um, but you can with Crohn's disease, you can actually get scar tissue on the inside, inside the lumen of the, the small intestine. Uh, and that is, we figured out what that's from. It's uh, from a, a molecule called transforming growth factor beta. Uh, so the presence of inflammation causes a release uh, of this wicked cytokine called tumor necrosis factor beta. Uh, what it does is it calls in like most cytokines do and they call in the troops but this one calls calls in fibroblasts so you get a fibroblast heavy type of inflammation and all these fibroblasts spit do what they do fibroblasts make fiber specifically type 3 collagen um, which is good for repairing wounds and things like that but in Crohn's disease there's too many of them and they start spitting it out into the lumen and it starts building and building and it can make a big tangle within inside the lumen of the intestine uh, and that leads to obstruction um, so I don't know why but TGF beta is way overproduced in people with Crohn's disease not all people but some people there's a nice drawing of a nice open lumen and then all of a sudden in this Crohn's patient it's like these spider webs which are blocking the full fecal material so these people are prone to get intestinal blockage Here's another Crohn's uh, patient where you see a stricture, beaver dam, uh, in this patient. Here's an example of fat wrapping. I'm sorry, I can't warn you when gross pictures are coming. Uh, but we know from looking at our cadavers that this is not a normal looking uh, small bowel, right? We've never seen fat like that. There's fat everywhere in this thing. That's not because the person was obese or anything. Uh, it's called fat wrapping and that's the phenomenon where the adipocytes can migrate and they become phagocytic and start helping the inflamed part of the intestine. What about some clinical features? 
So let's really get into these a little deeper. Patients typically start out with constitutional symptoms. They think maybe they got the flu. They just don't. They got a bug. They don't feel good. Got malaise, fatigue, maybe some weight loss. They get diarrhea. May even have a low-grade fever. I mean, there's a zillion things that can cause symptoms like that. Abdominal pain. Um, they can have that. People with ulcerative colitis tend to get more abdominal pain. Uh, and then if they're going to be one of the extra intestinal type, uh, they start getting joint pain and muscle pain maybe. So really kind of a flu-like symptoms. Uh, let's see. What causes the pain? We know this. It's the inflammation. The inflammation stimulates nociceptors uh, and... Yeah, nociceptors cause pain, right? The stretch and the inflammation. It's kind of intuitive. There's a word here you should know uh, called uh, tenesmus. Ten e es, like an egg is the e sound. Tenesmus, fus, mus, tenesmus. Um, this is goes with defecation or micturation. So micturation, um, that's peeing and that's pooping. Uh, so people with Crohn's disease, they tend to get tenasmus with regard to uh, defecation. And they sit on the toilet and they push and they push. And it's not that they're constipated when the, uh, when the fecal material comes out. It's a nice, healthy, soft looking fecal material. It's not rock hard, that co which would cause constipation. Uh, but that's called uh, a rectal tenasmus uh, is goes with Crohn's disease. Uh, if for urinary problems and stenosis and things like that, they can have vesicular tenesmus. Make sure you know those words. Uh, could be on boards. Uh, and that's just really straining and pushing super hard. Less common in patients with Crohn's disease, uh, but it could occur, especially if it's involving the rectum. More common with ulcerative colitis. Okay, we kind of coming full circle here we talked way back in the beginning Crohn's disease loves to inflame the distal ileum and that's where our cabam receptors are so therefore people with Crohn's disease often become vitamin B12 deficient uh, if someone has Crohn's disease and they're not being managed maybe the greatest you should test for vitamin B12 deficiency especially if they start developing sciatica like symptoms or ridiculous symptoms maybe it's got nothing to do with pinch nerve anywhere it's uh, the myelin not being replaced remember you need vitamin b12 uh, to replace and build the myelin around your nerves the wiring around nerves uh, and then of course you can get intestinal block you can get obstruction symptoms uh, one classic symptom is a colicky pain which i should explain um, so colicky pain uh, has to do with a crescendo decrescendo pain if you have a bowel movement moving through your intestine and it all of a sudden gets blocked, peristalsis is moving that, by the way, right? That fecal material. All of a sudden it gets blocked. Uh, your body knows that and it starts backing up. And the peristalsis just above that blockage starts going really, really hard in these rhythmic waves. And it starts to get so hard it can drop you to the floor and you have horrible stomach pain. And then it comes on for oh, make a couple minutes, and then it dissipates. It crescendos, horrible pain, decrescendos. That is a colicky pain where it ramps up, and it's trying to squeeze. It's trying to push the poop through the blockage. And uh, if it can't do it, it'll wet, rest, and it'll go again. It's almost like giving birth, like labor pains. Uh, and you can have colicky pain for gallstones, the body, the body trying to push the gallstone or push the stone uh, through the common bile duct or through the bile duct uh, or same thing a kidney stone through the ureter you get a colicky pain where it pushes and it backs off and pushes again so that's what a colicky pain is uh, and these patients with blockages can have colicky pains um, it's rare for patients with Crohn's disease to bleed ulcerative colitis patients can bleed like crazy uh, but not not uh, CD patients. Uh, you could do a fecal occult blood test and that might be positive in about 
percent or so but you're not going to see hematochesia really bright red blood like you would with ulcerative colitis no melina depending on where you know it's coming from um, but fecal blood cult the test you might see some particles of blood on that test diarrhea is a problem uh, but that's only a problem if you get an intestinal blockage uh, well no let me take that back that's not only for intestinal blockage uh, in fact we said way at the beginning that's the most common most universe symptoms di diarrhea and this has nothing to do with a blockage it could, diarrhea of course can happen uh, in intestinal blockage but you don't need a blockage to get diarrhea with Crohn's disease your enterocytes in your distal ileum uh, and in most of your, especially your distal ileum they're really good at taking up water we used to think it was the large intestine and it's not the large intestine can still take up water not like the small bowel now uh, but if they're inflamed and all irritated they go on strike and they say I'm not taking up any water I'm hurt I'm not working and so how does the water get taken out of the fecal material which is super important for hydration it's not taken out uh, it tends to go right through uh, that important region, uh, especially if it's in your ileum and in your uh, your proximal small bowel, which also takes out water. So you can't take out water. You're going to have really watery fecal material, and that's basically diarrhea. And that's the story with diarrhea. It's super common. Differential diagnosis. Sometimes it's really tough to tell apart from ulcerative colitis. Uh, this one tends to bleed, have a bloody hematochesic diarrhea, lots of blood in the diarrhea. Um, they both can give you diarrhea. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which we didn't get to, kind of a basket category. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome, we don't know what causes it, but they tend to have constipation on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, maybe don't poop. Thursday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they have diarrhea. They go back and forth, and they have stomach upset and all sorts of. We don't. That's. I'm not even sure if I have a video on that one or not. But um, maybe they're taking NSAIDs and didn't tell you. And they ask the NSAIDs are ripping up, uh, especially if they're COX-1 inhibitors. Uh, maybe it's. Uh, maybe they got a bug. Maybe it's a virus or bacteria that's invaded the mucosal layer. And causing an inflammation irritation that can do the same thing right bacteria or virus if it infects the mucosal cells they go on strike we're not taking up water we're sick so the water goes right through his diarrhea uh, we didn't talk about diverticulums much uh, but remember the appendix is a diverticulum uh, they're out pouching there's a whole bunch of these things uh, they can get infected just like your pancreas does uh, and it can cause pain as well. Um, so those red ones, the I mean, ischemic bowel disease, amyloidosis, vascular, these are pretty rare. I kept them in there, but uh, for testing purposes, just focus on the uh, on the red ones here. Uh, what about the treatment? Okay, we're winding down. Um, so there's no cure for Crohn's disease. Uh, treatments geared at relieving the symptoms of an attack getting it into remission and keeping it into remission. Uh, so different net definition of remission includes decreased symptoms, uh, mucosal lining healing. You can go down with endoscope, now your cobblestone instead of uh, ulcers, uh, fixing any nutritional deficits. Uh, so a couple of the medications, there's a bunch of them, but there's two that you probably should know. Um, the sulfasalazine is used very commonly to treat mild to moderate Crohn's disease been around forever uh, better for Crohn's disease that has affected the colon it works really good for that third of people who get it just in the colon uh, it snuffs out inflammation uh, also used to treat ulcerative colitis uh, it's delivered by suppository or entoma so it's not a pill that you take kind of stick it, uh, stick it up there. Uh, doses we don't care about. Uh, it's a mesoalanine based product. Or mesoalanine based products used to be used were popular uh, and it's not recommended. Uh, there's some cancer concerns with them. Uh, antibiotics. So 
right? Bacteria get, you get a bacteria infection, a bad one usually, uh, you should be on antibiotics, which is kind of bad because antibiotics kill off the good bacteria and tend to let the bad bacteria kind of repopulate things. So, uh, But nevertheless, I mean, you don't want to get septicemia or anything like that. So almost all Crohn's disease patients have a bacterial infection of some kind. Uh, therefore, antibiotic therapy, it's a very important part of the treatment. Um, the Cipro is the best one here. Uh, metronidazole uh, is another one. I don't know these ones that good. Uh, side effects are a problem, though. They tend to upset stomach. I mean, cause some, same of the, some of the same symptoms with uh, as the Crohn's disease. Peripheral neuropathy has been reported with these things. Uh, glucocorticoids. Uh, for patients, so you get out the big guns if some of those other treatments don't work. If they fail the treatments with that uh, sulfasalazine and antibiotics, then you got to they got to go on prednisone. Uh, it's a wicked anti-inflammatory. Remember, it cuts the uh, first step of the inflammatory cascade out, uh, and uh, works pretty good uh, if you have to come. But we talked about all the sequelae of. of especially coming off these are high doses right these are much more than your physiological doses so your HPA axis is going to be shut down so stress and we talked about that in this class in endocrinology um, hydrocortisone methylprednisone depomedrol which is also used for epidural steroid injections prednisolone um, yeah these are more powerful even prednisone is kind of the first step if that doesn't work get out the big guns very powerful anti-inflammatory uh, glucocorticoids uh, another one AZA um, these are thiopurine agents uh, you can use these for treatment and for maintenance once it's gone you want to keep it away uh, effective in about 50 percent of the patients who try them as a primary treatment 60 percent of patients uh, use it to keep the or 60 percent of patients who use it to keep their condition in remission so uh, if you're using it to stay in remission about 60 percent effective if you're using it as a primary treatment it's like 50 50 chance it's going to work steroids are probably better this is the one that's associated with Hodgkin's and not Hodgkin's lymphoma um, so be careful with that one Good old methotrexate's been around quite a while. Uh, sometimes Crohn's that doesn't respond to anything else can be treated with methotrexate. Um, especially a good alternative, the thiopurines. And yeah, it's also been used as a maintenance dose as well. Methotrexate, you might have heard of that. Um, that's psoriasis treatment, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it's been around for a long time for the treatment of those conditions. Hey, we made it. Uh, okay, great. So we are done. Uh, we have a final next week that I'll be working on over the weekend. And um, like I said, I have five of them to write. And I write like a turtle because I have to put it in the software. And it's very difficult. It's, I can't write as fast as I usually do. Uh, so I'm not sure about cut down slides. I'll probably give you something though like I did uh, some helpful hints like I did for the final lab examinations which all of you did really good on those. So okay we will see you around school after all this dust settles uh, and stay safe. <laughs>